Hi everyone, I'm so excited. We'll be filming a series of vlogs for you over the next few weeks and um, we're going to be looking in these vlogs at a topic that's um, so close to my heart that I feel like is such a timely topic for the church today and that's the topic of gender equality. Um, we wanted to film these in-depth studies so that there wouldn't be room for confusion or misunderstanding and so I'll be uh, taking us uh, through three key passages um, that I believe are important for gender equality um, and hopefully we'll get some time to really dig deep into these scriptures together. And so um, for today what I wanted to talk about is the context of the book of 1 Timothy. Um, context is not a um, kind of a get out clause where we get to just say oh no that's the context of the day so we can just ignore everything that is taught. Um, I believe that the book of 1 Timothy is incredibly important for the church today. I believe that it is uh, a timely book for the church today. So I don't believe that uh, context is our kind of, oh, let's just scrub out everything that 1 Timothy says. We're not going to apply it today. But having said that, I do believe that context is really important for us to clarify. If not, we will make the words of the book say something they were never intending to. Let me give you an example. Um, if you hear me disciplining my children, maybe in the mi middle of a heated argument, and I say to my children, I don't want anyone to talk anymore. If you take my words out of the context of that discipline situation, you will understand me to be a very different kind of parent than the parent I am. You will um, misunderstand my intentions for my children because rather than understanding what I'm saying as something that's corrective, you may take it to be my idea of what children should be like all of the time. Clearly, the context of my words um, is really important to understand in order to gain the right meaning from my words. And uh, studying any form of scripture, it, the exact truth is the same. It's, it's the same thing whether you're looking at Genesis or Proverbs or 1 Timothy. We have to understand the context of the scripture in order to gain the right uh, meaning from what the writer wrote. So what's the context of the book of 1 Timothy? Well, the scholar Linda Belleville puts it this way, that the, the stance of the whole book is corrective rather than didactic. What that means is that the book really isn't coming from neutral theological ground, but rather is uh, the writer Paul is wanting to bring correction to something that's gone terribly wrong in that church. Um, the book itself, in the chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, we see that Paul has told Timothy um, to stay in Ephesus so that he can combat the false teaching and the false teachers that were at work. And really that is the key to understanding the context of the book of 1 Timothy. Uh, the false teaching at work in that community uh, is repeatedly referenced in the book. We see um, that the false teaching was about myths and genealogies, was about a false understanding of the law was some were teaching false teachings around um, marriage and food and the need to abstain from certain foods and from marriage. Um, there was false teaching that really was, was not helpful in the community and was leading the community into error. And when we read Acts 20, we see that some of the problems that were arising in, in this community, the community in Ephesus, um, was not coming from fringe groups but rather was coming from people within the eldership themselves. And so this is a community that is in trouble. This is a community where false teaching, where um, things that are contrary to the gospel, contrary to orthodoxy are being spread uh, within the community. And those that are spreading those things are, are not on the fringes uh, necessarily, but there definitely are people right at the core of the community who are instigating the false teaching themselves. And so in chapter one of 1 Timothy and in chapter six of 1 Timothy, we see see Paul give Timothy a charge, a charge to fight the good fight, a, a charge to fight the warfare. And the context of that is him saying, um, fight false teaching. Essentially, the whole book is set up as, a, um, as instructions to help Timothy as he combats the influence of the false teachers. 
it's important for us to understand that the whole book, uh, as it's bringing correction to the false teaching, isn't giving theological corrections as such, but is giving practical corrections. Uh, Paul is instructing Timothy on how to bring practical restrictions into this community in order to stop the spread of false teaching. Uh, what's another thing that we can see about the context? Well, we can see from the very book that the false teaching um, had a great impact on women in the community. Um, Paul's reference to Eve's deception in 1 Timothy chapter 2 gives us kind of a signal that that's what's going on in this community. Women are being deceived uh, by the false teaching at work. And when we read 2 Timothy chapter 3, we see a confirmation of that where Paul talks about the weak-willed women who are becoming, uh, who are becoming captive to the false teaching that is um, at work in the community. And then we also see in 1 Timothy chapter 5 that not only were the women being deceived by the false teaching, but women were propagating the false teaching. We don't know if women were central um, false teachers who started the teaching, but we do know that the women were deceived, like I've just said, and women were then continuing to bring the influence of the false teachers as they spread what they'd heard throughout the community. Uh, 1 Timothy 5 is a very interesting um, chapter. It talks about widows. There's a lot of teaching around the widows, and it talks about these widows who were um, idlers and who were not only idle, but who were gossips and biddy busybodies. That word gossip is actually a word that is um, not about uh, gossiping behind someone's back, but it is rather about spreading nonsense. Gordon Fee does a great work on this where he shows us that in fact that Greek word, there, there is no example of that Greek Greek word uh, pertaining to gossips as such, but rather pertaining to people who were spreading nonsense, who were um, literally speaking against the truth. And so we have an example in 1 Timothy 5 that although maybe women weren't the initial instigators of false teaching, they certainly were continuing the influence of false teaching in the community in Ephesus that Paul is writing to. We actually see in chapter 1 of 1 Timothy that two um, central false teachers had already been excommunicated from the church. These were two men that Paul had um, thrown out of that church community. But unfortunately, we see with the whole premise of the book needing to be written that excommunicating those two false teachers did not curb the influence of the false teaching. There's still women present. There's still people present, maybe not just women, but we know certainly there were women who were present who, were, who had been thoroughly deceived by the false teaching and we're continuing to bring that influence. This is really important for us to understand as we approach the book of 1 Timothy. Paul wasn't teaching neutral theology as he wrote this letter. He wasn't speaking uh, into a context of health as he wrote this letter. Rather, he was communicating into a context that, it was in, that was incredibly unhealthy, that was in a state of real distress, where there was arguments, where there's quarreling, where there was strife, where there was real division within the community. And he wrote to Timothy as a mentor to a spiritual son, helping him, giving him instruction to bring corrective practices to curb the influence of the false teaching. If we read it as anything other than that, we will start understanding something very different to what Paul intended as he brought restrictions to the women.